right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. We are so delighted and so thankful that you have decided to, to, decided to join us here on today. Uh, welcome to all of you who are on Facebook, if you're on YouTube, on Twitter, uh, Instagram, watching through the My Sunday app, watching through our church's website. Uh, thank you for joining us here uh, on today. Well, welcome to our Winning Wednesday. Uh, well, we like to say that we are all winners. So listen, do us a favor. Make sure you tag some people, especially if you're watching on Facebook. Make sure you text some people and make sure you share this word uh, because this is going to be some great information that's going to be shared on today. Uh, we got it started a little bit on last week. Uh, we had Derek Flowers talk about uh, cancer awareness. And so uh, I just believe that all of us have been impacted in some form or fashion uh, with cancer, be it yourself or someone that you know, a family, a friend, a coworker. And so this is a very important topic. So we learned on last week from uh, Mr. Flowers that there are more than 200 types of cancer. Uh, did not know it was that many. And he really talked in depth about the five top uh, cancers that we normally deal with in society, the ones that are the top five. And so you got to go back in and listen to that. But he talked about the importance of getting screened, um, getting tested, uh, the risks, the dangers, knowing your numbers, very important to go to the doctor, get checked out. So he did all of that. But he also ended uh, with, was, which was very important and just very on time. He talked about nutrition. And he talked about diet and just how important it is. And so with many of us who are contracting or either dying from cancer, um, and, there, and there are so many reasons for that. It could be genetic, um, it could be exposures, um, other reasons, um, but also it could be diet. So diet may play a hand in it as well. You know, as Americans, we're eating more processed foods, more foods that contain preservatives, and so, uh, which was not, you know, uh, back in the day, you just didn't tell of that, didn't hear of that. Um, but so our guest for today, uh, well, she is no stranger. She has been with us many times. I'm just so excited to have Dr. Larissa. She just really knows how to explain uh, the material so that even a child can understand. And so she is going to talk about those foods that we need to include in our diet, maybe some foods we need to avoid. And so listen, we want to make sure, I'm, I want to put a disclaimer on this. This is not, you know, this does not give you leeway to say, hey, I'm not going to take any more chemo. I'm not doing this. Please obey your doctors. Uh, what we're doing on today is going to be a supplement to what you should be doing with your uh, physicians. And so I introduce to you guys, uh, Dr. Larissa. Hello, Larissa. Hello, Lady Pam. It's so good to be back. <laughs> oh, good to see you too, because you moved from Birmingham to Florida. Mm -hmm. You're a, a Florida Gator now. I'm a Florida Gator now. So yeah, yeah. yeah. I know I had to make sure I was on at the right time because it's one o'clock here. And I was like, yes. is that noon? No, it's not one. <laughs> so I still still always glad, always involved with our, my Birmingham family. It's like I haven't actually left Birmingham. So. <laughs> exactly, exactly, which is what I, we love about virtual because you can still be far away and still be connected. So exactly. So, so I am excited. So um, like I said last week, Derek really talked about he, I mean, at the very end of his presentation, he really talked and that plate, the same plate, I think that you give mm -hmm. us is the one that he presented and really talked about, you know, fruits and vegetables, but I know you're going to break it down even further. And so yeah. Um, please, and also viewers, if you have any questions, um, especially if you're on Facebook and YouTube, uh, make sure you send, um, put in the comment section, have any questions, uh, we can address a few of those uh, at, at the end of the presentation, so. Yeah, for sure. No. All right, I will go ahead and share my screen and ask the mandatory question, can you see my screen? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was in an actual live meeting the other day, and uh, the person who like, went up was like, can you see? Of course you can see my screen. We're all here. <laughs> um, all right. So um, like Kaylee, Lady Pam said, we're going to be talking about cancer fighting foods today. 
Um, and you made a very important disclaimer. That was actually going to be the first thing that I was going to do. So thank you. <laughs> You're on the same wavelength. Um, that this um, is not meant to um, basically override your current cancer treatment if this is something um, that you're interested in incorporating. Um, this is a supplement um, to your cancer treatment. Always listen um, to your doctors in terms of your chemo, radiation, um, all those different things. Um, and also make sure that if you are gonna be making any dietary changes to also let your pharmacist know because there may be some interactions with foods and drugs that your doctor may not be aware of, that you may not be aware of, but your pharmacist has been educated um, to know that. Um, so that goes for everybody, not just uh, people who are taking cancer medications. There are certain antibiotics. Um, I take a medication that I shouldn't be eating grapefruit with so out of it's a random one. So always make sure you're talking to your pharmacist, you're talking to your doctor, especially when you're making any kind of dietary changes. All right, so let's jump in. So like Lee Pam said, I have moved. I have gone from UAB to the University of Florida. So I am now um, University of Florida Gator. Um, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to abandon my Birmingham family um, and abandon my previous research interests either. I'm just now building upon them. So um, if you've seen me before, you know that I'm a nutritional neuroscientist. I look a lot at um, how uh, diet can go on to affect chronic pain outcomes. Um, but now while I'm here um, at, in Florida, we're basically taking that a step further and looking at how, how is the diet um, influencing these pain outcomes. So we're studying um, epigenetic mechanisms. And if you've never heard of epigenetics, I'm going to explain it here in a second, just because it is something that's important to note for cancer as well. Um, and basically, we're looking at how nutrition interacts with epigenetic mechanisms underlying chronic pain, and then also extending that into brain and cognition uh, diseases such as Alzheimer's. So um, if you see, this was one of my first papers that I got published. I have my own little my own little party for a second with uh, my group here at UF. Um, and I know a couple of them are watching. So shout out to them. They're awesome. Lots of cool stuff coming out of UF. Um, if you're interested. So I know you guys have been talking about this, um, but I'm just going to kind of reiterate, you know, what is cancer? What are we talking about today? Because I sometimes I feel like we talk about it and it seems like this huge, humongous, scary, monstrous thing that but nobody can actually really explain what it is. Um, so um, you probably already know from last week that cancer affects one in three people in the U.S. So uh, like we were talking about earlier is the chances are you know someone or you have been affected by cancer. Um, and so hopefully this little slide will help, um, you know, understand, help you understand what cancer is. So our bodies are made up of trillions and trillions of cells. We all know that we've, we're this giant mass of cells um, that normally over our lifetime will grow and divide as we need. Um, but as sometimes they, um, are abnormal, they, they make mistakes or they get old and they usually, um, our body knows to kill them off, get rid of them. Um, and that happens, that's happening right now, every single second of the day, all the time in your body. But what happens is when you have cancer, something starts to go wrong in this process and your cells keep making new cells that are abnormal, that don't die off um, as they should. So as a result, those cancer cells will grow out of control and basically crowd out your healthy, normal cells. And this makes your body, uh, it's really hard on your body to work the way it should. Um, and thankfully we live in 2022 where, you know, for many people, cancer can be treated successfully. Um, a lot of the time it comes down to early screening um, and prevention. So always make sure you're getting, you know, you're doing your 50 year old colonoscopy, you're doing your mammograms, you're doing your, your pap smears. If you're a woman, like you always do all those things. They seem pretty, you know, invasive, but I always tell myself that it's better than having cancer for, or stage four cancer because I didn't catch it early. So a lot of people like more than ever can lead a full life after cancer treatment. Um, and as you talked about, there are many types of cancer. 
over 200 of them. That was a new fact for me when you said that, um, Lady Pam. Um, but I do know that they can be divided. Those 200 can basically be into two classes. Ones are that affect the blood and then other ones that have a solid tumor. Um, so what happens um, when you have cancer um, and these abnormal cells are growing, Cancer cells are gonna develop because of multiple changes in their genes. So just to kind of take a step back, our genes are made up of DNA and everyone's heard of DNA as kind of like the, um, the instructions for your life. So every single one of our cells has uh, a genome or, a group, or all our genes um, together. And so what can happen um, when you have cancer is one of two things. Um, you can actually have mutations in those instructions. So it's like somebody came along and, you know, cut out a page of the instruction manual and you're flipping through it and you're missing a page and it doesn't, so the thing doesn't work correctly when you're done. Or um, that would be called a genetic um, or genomic uh, change. Or you can have what's called an epigenomic change, which means, which is what I study, which means above the genome. So it's actually changing how your body and your cells read the DNA instructions and use it. Um, so it's almost like if you needed glasses and you didn't have your glasses and you were trying to read the instruction manual, you're probably gonna miss some stuff um, because you didn't see it properly. There's just something going on where you're not reading it correctly. And regardless of the cause, you're going to get these abnormal cells that start to grow out of control. Um, so lifestyle habits, um, genes you get from your parents, and being exposed to cancer-causing agents in your environment all play a role. So it can actually make those physical mutations, or it can make those epigenetic mutations, meaning that changing the way your DNA is being read. But many times there's no obvious cause. Uh, but today we're going to talk about lifestyle habits um, and because I study basically the way that our food interacts with our genes in terms of that epigenetic component. So our food can actually influence the way our bodies and our cells read our DNA, which I think is really, really cool. All right. So... Let's dive into the cancer food connection. So it is actually very challenging um, to be in the nutrition space. <laughs> um, and it's hard to find specific links between food and a specific disease or um, including cancer because uh, many foods contains, contain many substances Then they may either lower or increase cancer risk. And then other, uh, other things include like we all eat a different like a large variety of food. We eat and drink different things every single day. This can create interactions that are hard to study. So the effects of a food or nutrient can vary depending on how much of it you eat. So um, that being said, there is some good research out there um, showing um, which foods uh, tend to increase your risk of cancer and which foods lower your cancer risk. And another thing that's interesting that we're going to talk about next is that some research is showing that it may not necessarily be the food, but how the food is prepared that influences the risk um, or benefits. So we'll start with the bad news, um, which is the foods that are going to increase your risk of cancer. And if you've been following me or you've seen some of my talks, you're gonna notice a pattern with these foods. <laughs> um, and so the first one that I'm gonna point out is processed meats, um, in particular processed red meat. Um, so we've talked a lot before about how we need to, regardless of the way that it's been processed, to you know, enjoy a steak now and again, enjoy some bacon every once in a while, that's fine, but we can't be doing it every day and expect um, good results. So there's a lot of saturated fat um, in those um, processed red meats, processed meats in general as well, that um, will go on to um, potentially uh, increase your risk of cancer if they are not, if they're kind of out of control. And the other thing is a lot of processed meats have a lot of chemicals in them to make their shelf life um, stay pretty, pretty long. Um, so, but we're learning that, you know, those things are also potential, um, potentially carcinogenic, meaning that they can cause cancer. 
Um, the other one is uh, trans fats. Thankfully, we don't really have to worry about that one anymore because it is banned now um, in the US. Um, so that trans fats um, were found in a lot of processed baked goods, processed meats, um, all kinds of things, anything that was going to have to sit on a shelf for a pretty long time without going bad. Those we've discovered, the reason they got banned is they are very, very toxic um, to our to our cells. Um, they can cause cancer, cognition problems, chronic pain, all kinds of things. So thankfully those are gone, but I should also just mention them. Uh, next on the docket is our refined sugar, um, the one that's really, really hard to quit. So um, refined sugars and carbohydrates, I like to think um, are anything that is white minus cauliflower. Cauliflower is not a refined sugar. <laughs> um, but basically, if you go to the store and you get a big bag of white sugar, um, that is a refined sugar. Anything that's going to have added sugar in it is going to have refined sugars that have been added to the recipe to make it taste better. Um, things like high fructose corn syrup, um, that is usually another one that's really, really big. Um, and all of these refined sugars um, and refined carbohydrates can actually cause um, oxidative stress. And I think we've talked about oxidative stress on here before, um, but basically it causes um, a lot of your cells to start oxidizing and that oxidation process can actually damage your DNA. And that is what can cause cancer as well. So refined sugars, processed meats, and then the most interesting one for me as well um, that I couldn't leave out is the way that we prepare our food is critical um, to our increased or decreased risk of cancer. So a lot of the time I know in the South, we all love our barbecue, um, but we tend to eat the burnt parts um, for flavor. We tend to burn things. Um, the actual charcoal part, the burnt part, the black stuff that will flake off um, is oxidized food. Um, and eating a lot of that can actually um, increase oxidative stress in your body. Um, so we want to make sure that, you know, every now and again, it's totally your body is equipped to handle it. Um, go out in, you know, you know, burn some stuff for some flavor. Um, I'm particularly bad with um, burning my bacon, <laughs> which I get processed meat and um, burning it, probably not the best thing for me. I love like burnt bacon for whatever reason. Um, but just to be mindful of that, just to uh, uh, make sure we don't do that all the time. The other thing is when we're cooking with oils, um, we different oils are going to have what's called a different smoke point. So what that means is the temperature in which that oil will start to burn. So some like canola oil, sunflower oil, they will actually have really low smoke, smoke, smoke points. So it takes a lot less of a temperature for it to burn versus things like olive oil, avocado oil, which have a higher smoke point. And if we go back to what we just talked about, about burning, um, we don't want the oil to burn um, because that is going to oxidize the oil and then we're going to eat it. Um, so when you're cooking with oils, it's best um, to one, use a little bit, um, and then two, make sure you're using a high smoke point oil and cooking it on a medium, medium high heat. I know sometimes we're in a rush and we just have to crank it up and we gotta cook it really, really fast. Um, but we wanna make sure that we don't oxidize that oil. Plus it also makes the oil taste bitter. So there's your other reason to um, not cook on a high heat and use a high smoke point oil. It's gonna make your taste, your food taste bad anyway. And so, Lisa, so let me ask you a question. When you mm -hmm. talk about oxidation and yeah. you talked about the grilling of the food and that burnt part yeah. of the meat. And so oxidation then increases your risk of getting cancer. Yes, it does. Wow. So, yeah, so it'll go back and it'll increase your risk of that oxidative stress. The same, same mechanism that the sugar does that can damage your cells in your cells DNA. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then I had a question about the processed food. So mm -hmm. you mentioned that I said, uh oh, are you talking about like turkey bacon or uh, so meat? What you're, the, the, those kinds of meats are starting to get better. So what you're going to want to do is flip it over. And if you can see chemicals and ingredients that you don't really know what it is, okay. um, those are the kinds of things. The other thing to look for is where it falls on the ingredients list. 
If it's towards the end, that means there's not as much in it. They typically go in descending order on the ingredients list. So if it's not got a lot in it um, and you're only eating it, you know, two or three times a week, then I wouldn't necessarily worry too, too much. Um, but especially things like bacon and things that have a lot of nitrates in them, like hot dogs, uh, things like that, they typically are the ones that are um, the, the villains here, I should say. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yes. Nope, those are great questions. Great questions. So I'll leave the bad news behind and we'll move on to the good news. So I know you guys probably already talked about um, this last week, but we're going to go a little bit further. So um, again, if you've been with us um, and you'll notice a pattern, fruits and vegetables always pop up. I know they're not everybody's favorite, um, but they're my favorite for uh, taste reasons and then also for um, the following reasons. So fruits and vegetables are all on this list. <laughs> um, there's only one type of meat that on this list um, that are, are very likely to lower your uh, risk of several types of cancer. So they've actually been studied um, extensively in head and neck cancers, um, esophageal cancer, so just the cancer of your throat, stomach cancer, lung cancer, pancreatic cancer, and prostate cancer. And the reason that um, fruits and vegetables are so powerful is they create, they have a lot of what are called phytonutrients. So it's P-H-Y-T-O nutrients. Um, and those are the things that are going to be giving the fruits and vegetables their color. So basically the deeper the color of the the fruit or vegetable, the more phytonutrients it's going to have. So the phytonutrients will work together to lower cancer risk um, together. Um, and some will help regulate hormones such as estrogen, which is important for things like ovarian cancer, uterine cancer, breast cancer. Some others will actually slow cancer cell growth by basically interfering with um, the epigenetic part that we were talking about earlier will basically say you need to stop growing. This isn't right. Um, or they will also block inflammation um, and inflammation, increased levels of inflammation can also lead to cancer risk. So the fact that these can decrease the inflammation is um, good. Uh, and many, 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 many fruits and vegetables will lower oxidative stress and lower oxidative damage. That is a really, really key component. So we're gonna go over some of the, the fruits and vegetables um, that have been actually studied. Um, I had to go through the literature to, to see which ones have been showing really, really consistent results. Um, so the first group that I wanna talk about is your cruciferous vegetables. Um, nobody, this is the one group that I would say the majority of people turn their nose up to because sometimes they can be stinky, sometimes they can be bitter, um, but they're really, really good for you. So cruciferous vegetables include broccoli, cauliflower, kale, um, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, basically all the green things. Um, and they contain a lot of beneficial nutrients, including vitamin C, vitamin K, and manganese. Um, and they also contain a phytonutrient called uh, sulfluorophane, and that's what makes them green. Um, and it is a plant compound that has been extensively studied to have anti-cancer properties. So um, one study that I uh, found showed that sulfluorophane significantly um, slowed down cancer cell growth and stimulated the death of those cancer cells in colon cancer. So that was really interesting. Um, another study showed that sulfluorophane um, significantly inhibited breast cancer tumor development and size. Um, because it has, it has the ability to basically block an enzyme linked to cancer development. So it'll basically stop um, the cancer cells from growing to uh, make this tumor smaller um, or start to die off, um, which is really, really great. Um, so one review that I read recommended uh, three to five servings of cruciferous vegetables a week. Um, to show the best cancer preventing effects. So three to five servings of green vegetables a week. We wanna have three to five servings of fruits and vegetables a day, um, but three to five of those a week 
could be your greens um, as well. So um, next um, is a nutrient called lycopene. So lycopene is a, is a nutrient that's found in tomatoes. Tomatoes are, I love tomatoes. I had a bunch of them for lunch, actually. Um, tomatoes are best known for lycopene, but they're also, um, it's also found in things like grapefruit and watermelon. So um, watermelon is actually like 95% water and then the rest is like lycopene, which is great. <laughs> um, and it is red in color and it's what gives um, these fruits and vegetables uh, their, their color. So studies have shown that lycopene may protect against the cancers of the lung, stomach, prostate, colon, mouth and throat, um, and further down our esophagus. Um, so it is, it is one of those ones that is very well known for its cancer, anti-cancer effects. So again, we want to aim to have, you know, two to three servings a week um, of these fruits and vegetables that contain lycopenes, things like grapefruit, tomatoes, watermelon, um, apricots, basically anything that's got a red tint to it. So red or, red or orange will have some lycopene. Speaking of that, um, apples. Uh, so everybody's heard the phrase, an apple a day takes the doctor away. Um, and it actually rings fairly true, especially in, when it comes to cancer. So apples contain a lot of nutrients that have promising anti-cancer properties. So they have what are called, again, type of phytonutrient called polyphenols. Um, and these are compounds that may prevent inflammation, cardiovascular disease, and infections. So some research suggests that um, these polyphenols that are in apples possess anti-cancer and tumor fighting properties. So for example, um, uh, one study in 2018 suggested that um, apple nutrients significantly inhibited the growth of breast cancer cells while not affecting the normal cells. So it was inhibiting the growth of the bad cells while protecting the good ones, which I always find so fascinating that an apple can do that, <laughs> can distinguish between the two. Uh, another group that we should always aim to eat um, because they're very deep in color. Remember, the deeper the color, the more uh, phytonutrients they're going to have um, are berries. So berries are super tiny, but they are mighty. So they are rich in vitamins, minerals, and dietary fiber. Um, and they also um, are showing a lot of interest to uh cancer researchers because of their antioxidant properties. So going all the way back to that oxidative stress component we were talking about, oxidation, berries have the ability to stop that from happening. Um, so they, that is really what kind of drive their health benefits. So um, there's a study that showed um, that compounds in blackberries actually lower biomarkers that are um, known to be a risk factor for colon cancer. Um, another study demonstrated the anti-inflammatory effects of blueberries, um, that can actually, and can actually prevent the growth of breast cancer tumors. This was in mice. Um, so berries are chock full. So strawberries, blueberries, cherries, raspberries, all those things. We try to incorporate them. The best way I like to do it is that's usually my dessert after dinner is I'll get a bowl of berries. Um, and then I'll take, you know, a little bit of honey and drizzle it on top. And it's just, it's so good. Um, and you can even heat them up in the microwave and make them warm. Um, and it actually will make them taste sweeter without um, you having to add any extra sugar to it as well. So if you warm them up a little bit. So carrots um, contain several essential nutrients, including vitamin K, vitamin A, and other antioxidants. So those, that oxidative stress stopper. They also contain high amounts of beta carotene, which is responsible for the orange color, but is also plays a vital role in supporting our immune system. So our immune system is going to be the one that's going to be identifying cancer cells in order to kill them. Um, so if we can support our immune system, then we can um, help prevent certain types of cancer. Um, there was a review of eight studies that showed um, that the beta carotene um, found in carrots has links to the reduction of the risk of breast and prostate cancer. Um, 
And another analysis was very interesting showed that a higher consumption of carrots um, resulted in a 26% lower risk of developing stomach cancer. So carrots, <laughs> very, very good. Um, this is the only non-fruit or vegetable that uh, you will see on here and you'll always see it come up um, whenever we talk about this. Um, it's fatty fish. Uh, so fatty fish includes things like salmon, mackerel, anchovies, and it is rich in really essential vitamins and nutrients such as vitamin B, potassium, and omega-3s. So a lot of studies have been done, um, especially if you go back and listen to our Mediterranean diet conversation that we had this summer, a lot of studies have been done following a lot of cultures that include a lot of fatty fish in their diet. Um, and what they're finding is that those cultures um, tend to have lower disease risks. Um, and really the only thing that's uh, there's a few things that are different, but in terms of um, diet that really stands out is their consumption of fish. In Western culture, we don't um, consume fish as often as we should. Um, so one study found that people who had diets um, high in these fatty fish um, had a 53% lower risk of colorectal cancer than those who were not eating um, fatty fish. So the recommended daily amount is uh, five to seven uh, servings of fish a week. So I like to think five or seven, five to seven meals um, to include things like shrimp, um, uh, mollusks are really good, uh, crabs really good, a lot of the sea, I don't know if you guys like sea snails. Um, I've had them before, they're not my favorite. <laughs> uh, it's a texture thing, the taste was okay, it was the texture. Um, but just try to get and incorporate more fish into your diet. And if you're not interested in jumping right in and doing snails, things like salmon, cod, um, halibut, those are all very, very mild um, uh, fish that you can incorporate. And Larissa, let me ask you about the fish. So what yeah. about, I know she didn't mention flounder or whiting. So yep. Are those like leaner and they're not as fatty as the other ones? Yep. So they're a little bit leaner, but they still are going to have um, the fats that you want. So um, yeah, so flounder, whiting, all those things are all on the list as well. Okay. Basically any kind of fish is better than no fish. <laughs> okay. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And, and, and Larissa, should it be um, wild versus farm? I know there's. A lot yeah, of no, that's a great question. That. Um, if you can, um, try to buy wild caught um, as opposed to farm raised because the odds of them having high amounts of mercury are going to be lower um, if they're wild caught. And then the same thing goes with um, the size of the mouth of the fish. So normally the smaller the mouth, the less mercury it will have ingested. Um, and it's time. So I know a lot of people worry about the uh, mercury um, when it comes to fish. So that's why you'll see things like sardines and <laughs> uh, anchovies on the list is because they're super, super tiny fish. So um, the odds of them having um, mercury in them enough to poison you is like next to none. So yeah. yeah. So you can Google, there's a lot of great resources out there that are that will tell you which ones are wide mouth and which ones are small mouth fish. Um, and then also if you're in the grocery store and you have the option to buy wild caught over farm raised, that would be your better option for mercury if you're worried about that. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful question. Mm -hmm. um, still on the um, effects of omega-3s inflammation, that leads us to walnuts. We're almost done. I think I have two more after this. Um, walnuts, um, they have um, basically been studying, so the American Institute for Cancer Research has been studying nuts a lot um, and found that all nuts, all of them, peanuts, tree nuts, all of them, um, have cancer, prevent, cancer preventing properties um, because they all have really, really um, great levels of omega-3s and good fats. Um, ho however, uh, scientists have studied walnuts more than any type of nut. And I always say they're always good for your brain because it looks like a brain as well when you pull it out. Um, so I always think that's really cool. So walnuts contain um, a substance that basically our bodies will bind to estrogen receptors and will play a role in preventing 
breast cancer. Um, so walnuts are really, really great, especially for um, women and for men, but um, especially for a lot of um, women. So in one animal study, mice receiving whole walnuts and walnut oil actually had higher levels of those tumor suppressing genes. So back to our genes, their body, their bodies were kind of churning out more of the proteins um, and more of the instructions to make um, proteins that will actually kill off um, cancer cells and um, make tumors um, go away faster. Um, then mice receiving regular vegetable oil. So walnuts are pretty powerful. They're powerful in a lot of different domains. They're always a constant when it comes to health. Um, and it doesn't, it's not any different for cancer as well. Second to last is our legumes. So these are things like beans and soy, um, peas, lentils. And one thing that's really great about them is they're really high in fiber. And fiber um, is actually going to be the thing that is going to help uh, lower your person's risk of developing cancer. So there was a big meta-analysis done um, that showed a really strong association with um, higher bean consumption and lower risk of cancer. Um, another reason why is because often when we're eating beans as our source of protein, we are able to better limit our red meat consumption. So not only is eating more beans going to be beneficial, but it's also going to help you um, in your quest to um, eat red meat in moderation and still get enough protein as well. Um, so there um, is lots of studies out there um, looking at the intake of bean fiber, risk of breast cancer, colon cancer, um, head and neck cancers, all kinds of things. Um, and a study found, I found um, people who ate diets that were high in beans were 20% less likely to develop breast cancer than those who did not meet their daily fiber intake. So beans are super great. And last, but certainly not least, um, is our really good friend, my really good friend, um, <laughs> green tea. Um, so all teas um, do have uh, anti-cancer properties. So black tea, um, like the orange pico tea, all those kinds of things. But green tea is probably the most potent and has been the most studied. Um, so they have a lot of those phytonutrients. Um, and the one that is particularly interesting in green tea, and I actually have a friend who did her entire PhD dissertation on this, um, is a compound called, it's got a really long name, so I'm just gonna act, abbreviate it, it's called EGCG. Um, it's got a really long name, so we're gonna call it EGCG. <laughs> um, and EGCD, EGC, EGCG, there we go, <laughs> um, is a very, 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 very potent um, anti-cancer um, phytonutrient. And it is all up in the green tea. It is, there's so much um, EGCG in green tea. So these chemicals, um, things like EGCG have um, substantial free radical scavenging activity, which means they lower oxidative stress. So all of those things that were causing your oxidative stress to go up, EGCG can bring it back down um, and may protect cells from DNA damage um, from that oxidative stress as well. Um, they have also been shown um, to inhibit tumor cell growth um, and actually kill cancer cells in animal studies. So um, by one friend, she was actually out of UAB. Um, I'll have to link the paper down in the comments after this is over if you want to read it. Um, one of her dissertation um, chapters was using EGCG on um, type, or I think it's stage four breast cancer cells. Um, one of the ones that is the hardest, hardest to um, control and found that if you could treat them with EGCG, that they actually um, started to die off and the healthy cells started to grow. Um, so green tea is really awesome because it contains all of those polyphenols that protects against um, all of the damage that um, we subject ourselves to every single day. And it also may help um, increase our immune system function. Um, and last but not least, green tea has been shown to activate a lot of detox enzymes in our body. Um, 
that may help protect against tumor development. Um, but so we know that they um, are able to do this, but we're still in the process of figuring out how. Um, but we do know for now that green tea, if you can have maybe one or two cups a day um, at a minimum, would be a great place to start, especially um, if you are on a cancer journey. Green tea is awesome. I have one to two cups a day. Um, and uh, some days there's more than that. But if you can get it decaffeinated as well, if you do struggle with caffeine, is not something you worry about. Get some decaf green tea. So I went over a lot of stuff. So thankfully you'll be able to go back and watch. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention um, that's important about nutrition um, is when you are on your cancer journey and you are participating in things like chemotherapy and radiation and all kinds of medication um, you know, regimes, um, the, those can make you nauseated and suppress your appetite. Um, so I know a lot of people, a lot of friends that I've had that have, I've um, been with them through their cancer journeys, they don't want to eat um, because the thought of eating makes them want to throw up um, and they're, or they're just not hungry so they don't think about it. It is really, 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 really important um, to be intentional about intentional about eating um, and eating good food when you are on a cancer journey. Um, you should do this anyways, even if you are healthy, but especially if you are participating in things like chemo and radiation that don't make you feel your best anyway. Um, you will not want to eat, but try your best um, to eat small meals, just little bits. Um, something is better than nothing because a lot of research coming out um, is showing that a lot of people are dying, not necessarily of the cancer, but from malnutrition, from not eating because of the, um, the treatments that they're, they're having. So um, make sure that you still eat, um, even when you are taking <laughs> chemotherapy, radiation, getting all that done. I can't stress that enough. Um, you won't want to, but your body will thank you later. Um, so with that, I will leave the, the, the floor open for questions if there are any. Um, I have the Cooking Well um, Instagram, uh, Facebook, and then my personal Instagram down at the bottom there. Um, also, if you have any cancer specific questions, um, I may not be able to answer them off the top of my head because I'm not an oncologist. <laughs> Um, but I have friends who would be able to answer them. So if you still want to leave them, um, their comments, I can go back and answer them, um, after I ask, um, my experts <laughs> as well. So, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, Larissa, this was great. Uh, so I just thought of a question with your last, um, well, what you talked about people not wanting to eat, mm -hmm. um, have cancer, um, and so what about juicing? And I say that, or maybe smoothies, that could be a different yeah. option for them. We had a friend back in Georgia, and uh, this was years ago. And back then we were heavily into juicing. And so um, my husband had recommended, why don't you, you know, try carrot juice? And literally that was the only thing that she can keep down on her stomach. Yeah. Or mm -hmm. something like. So, um, which, which is that question. And then another question is, how else can we, incorporate these foods um, especially if you're not used to eating them or if you're very picky um, we talked about children and all that stuff mm -hmm. and puree veggies and put them in the spaghetti sauce and that yep. kind of stuff but um, how else like, if you can give us some tips on that yeah for sure so um, the first question about juicing and smoothies is in the, those instances like it's great um Anything is better than nothing. Um, smoothies are really good because you can add things like yogurt, which is gonna add more calories um, and gonna provide you with more energy um, because when you are sick, including um, cancer, um, the reason we end up losing a lot of weight is because our body is using a lot of energy fighting um, whatever the illness is. So we need to replenish um, those calories. Um, so things like you're saying, using carrot juice, um, apple juice, celery juice, all those things are really, really great. Um, a lot of the times if you include ginger in those, ginger is a natural anti-nauseant as well as peppermint, um, which is really, really great. 
Um, so if you can get mint, ginger um, mixed into those smoothies, into that juice, and that's all you can keep down, that is so much better um, than nothing. But you also want to make sure that you are getting um, calories as well. Um, so even if you were, I, I mean, one time I think I blended walnuts into my smoothie. Um, and those have a lot of calories and they also have all those anti-cancer um, properties as well. So even just throwing in the walnuts into your smoothie so you can get them down um, would be great. Um, other than that, so other ways that we can um, and put more fruits and vegetables in our bodies is um, you have you said my classic of you know pureeing the the vegetables putting them in spaghetti sauce that one's that one's really 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 good um, the other way I really like um, roasting my vegetables um, and what I'll do is I'll take um, the sun dried tomato and oregano dressing like the craft dressing <laughs> from the store you'll cut up your vegetables you'll squeeze a bunch on it put it in a plastic bag shake it up and let it sit for 30 minutes to overnight and you can grill them you can roast them and they just add a little bit more flavor so it's not like you're just eating plain vegetables which can kind of be boring I like it them plain I'm a vegetable freak so um not really for me but um that's one way you can do them. Smoothies are really, really awesome. Um, when you go to have things like tacos and fajitas, all those kinds of things, um, one thing you can do is you can cut up peppers and onions. Um, make sure you can also add green, or not green beans, but black beans on top. Um, that will have some beans in there. Um, avocado, and then you can get creative too. And you could shred up carrots and mix it in with the ground meat when you're cooking it. And so it kind of gets cooked in with it. It gets soft and you don't really see it. You don't really taste it as well. Um, I like to put corn in my fajitas. I like to put, what else do I like to put in my fajitas? Um, broccoli, zucchini, all kinds of things. You can just cut them up and literally throw them in um, with uh, as you're cooking your meat and just use it as the base. Um, and then the other thing that is really, really awesome these days is if you go to the frozen food section, you can actually get um, really good plant-based ground beef. Um, Morningstar Farms is one brand that I really, really like. Um, but it's all made, it's made out of peas and it's made out of soy protein. So you get all of your protein, you get some vegetables. Um, and lately with the, with the cost of meat going up, um, I don't know if it's as bad in <laughs> Birmingham as it is in Florida, but, um, the plant-based ground beef is actually a lot cheaper. Um, so for someone like me who, you know, um, I don't, I don't make the big bucks yet. Um, I still have to shop on a budget. Um, I've actually been eating way more plant-based meats, um, than I have regular meat. And so that's another good way that we can make a substitute, um, for that red meat as well that we were talking about that has all that saturated fat. No, this, this is great. Larissa, you gave us a lot to think about, uh, as always. Um, but I, I like to have you on because, you know, uh, you'll be on and then we'll kind of, you know, go back a few months and, you know, we'll, we'll have mm -hmm. you on again. And because I think we need reminders, at least right. have you on just kind of, okay, I need to do better about, <laughs> you know, eating healthy and, and also just being prepared. Um, because mm -hmm. a lot of times, you know, when you're on the go, you have multiple things going on. And if you have children or just, you know, got to work, you know, even planning your meals, um, mm -hmm. you know, to be better at that, planning healthy snacks, you know, grabbing healthy things in the car. And so, uh, no, this is this was great. I love how you talked about how certain foods can target certain cancers yeah. um, and just, you know, it, it can slow down the growth, um, mm -hmm. help build your immune system. And so all those were great, wonderful tips. Mm -hmm. And when you said Mediterranean diet, I said, oh, shoot. I remember last year, I was <laughs> We got to get her off a Mediterranean diet. I know. <laughs> I know. Said again, I said, oh, God, I got to get her off a Mediterranean diet. The, the green tea. I forgot mm -hmm. all about that. Yep. I green tea is awesome. It's, you know, I drink it now instead of um, my second cup of coffee in the morning. That's my 
what I do now. <laughs> that's, that's a good idea. I need to yeah. do that. I, mm-hmm. I, I didn't have the second cup of coffee today. I had the cup of water, but green tea. Yeah. Oh, what, what can you sweeten the green tea with? Um, honey, is that okay? Mm-hmm. Honey is good. Um, okay. I like to put lemon in it um, as well. Um, and you can actually get uh, green tea infused with different flavors. And what I found is the ones that you get, you know, berry infused as well is I don't even need sugar in those ones because there's enough flavors going on where this is fine just straight (laughs) yeah so yeah so honey's really really good um yeah I would say honey yeah that'd be really good because it's got it's got some good properties to it as well that's that's good that's one thing I need to work on is decreasing my sugar intake Mm -hmm. it's It's hard it's It's hard hard. (laughs) addiction <laughs> I know I know it's hard it's hard it, it took me a while I was like when I was in college I think I was drinking like one can of coke a day and that was not good yeah and it was to the point where like if I did have tea it tasted so bitter because I was so used to it being so sweet uh, but yeah. if you just you know take your time don't expect it to go super yeah. super fast but kind of wean yourself off of them eventually I'm like I still can't do coffee without sugar in it, but <laughs> I can do tea now without sugar in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, um, well, what I'm going to do, Larissa, is I'm just going to go over a couple of just upcoming events that we have mm-hmm. going on. Um, but I want you to come back and just end with um, how we can make just those subtle changes, um, just something to leave us, you know, so that you know, no one's feeling, oh, I got to go cold turkey tomorrow, you know, exactly. but, you know maybe, <laughs> not, maybe not tomorrow, but just maybe how we can make those subtle changes uh, to incorporate, you know, these fruits and veggies, this green tea, um, increasing the, the fish intake. Um, I didn't know it was that many per week. I was telling my husband yesterday, I said, I'm going to start making salmon once a week. I'm like, I'm behind. <laughs> that's a good, no, that's that's, it's, to, to your point, that's exactly what you need to start doing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> once a week, just try and make, you know. Anyway, I'll let you do that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay. We're going to come back in just a second. All right. Um, all right. Let me make sure everybody can see this. Make sure. Yeah. All right. So, um, of course, listen, don't forget, guys, on Tuesday, uh, Pastor Mason does a study of scriptures. Uh, so we are walking through the book of James. So that's every Tuesday at 11 o'clock a.m. Uh, Central Standard Time. Make sure you join us uh, for that. Of course, on today, you had uh, information, great information from uh, Dr. Larissa. Please go back and listen to last week's uh, broadcast with Derek Flowers with UAB. He talked about cancers. And so that was some really, it was a lot of information, but so much good information. Uh, so make sure you uh, go back and listen to that. Don't forget also, uh, we, you can now watch us from the website. Uh, you can watch us from the website. Uh, go to our website, bhmbc.org. Uh, did a couple of pictures to make it kind of explanatory for y'all, but there's going to be three little lines to the top left. If you click on that, it's going to direct you to this page and you're going to click watch live and whatever services we have that are going on live, you will actually see them uh, in real time. So if you're not on social media, a lot of people are not, this is great. Uh, You have internet, uh, you can use search the internet browser, uh, you can watch all of our services. Then on uh, the 21st, on the 21st, we have the virtual zoo with Miss Erin McGinnis. Uh, we are excited about that. It's going to be at 11 o'clock a.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, parents, make sure you send me an email, ladypam at tcowi.org, because we want all the kids to be there um, on, on Zoom, looking at the animals, asking questions, and so very interactive. Uh, but we're going to show it on social media, but please make sure uh, they email about email me about that. Also, we have our virtual graduation that's coming up. We want to celebrate all of our graduates from pre-K to kindergarten, high school, college. Uh, We have a speaker, Ms. Shana Spikes, who is always just motivational and encouraging, inspirational. Uh, She's great. That's going to be 10 a.m. Central Standard Time. Once again, guys, make sure you email me, uh, ladypam at tcowi.org, so that we can make sure that you have a front row seat uh, 
there uh, in the Zoom room. And then we are getting ready, of course, uh, for our upper room experience, uh, which is going to be May uh, 27th through June the 5th. Uh, every day between those dates at 6 a.m., we're going to be on our prayer room call. Uh, that number is 727-731-0433. Uh, and then all of that is going to lead up to our in-person service, which is going to be on June the 5th at 10 a.m. Central Standard Time. We have actually two in-person services um, during that month, June the 5th and also June the 19th. Um, on June the 5th, we're going to be serving uh, free Steel City Pops. Yep, Pops and Pentecost. How about that? So that's going to be June the 5th. And then uh, June the 19th, uh, we're going to, which is Father's Day, we're going to be celebrating all of our dads. We're going to have the World uh, Factor Food Truck on site authentic Jamaican food, um, really good, not too spicy. She has veggies in there, y'all, so we just talked about. Uh, so that's going to be great. Uh, so it's great food. So we're going to be uh, doing that on that particular day. Um, also, um, oneplace.com, don't forget that. Um, if you want to continuously grow in your spiritual world, Pastor May says on oneplace.com, uh, do a search for his name and you'll see all the messages uh, that are archived. And then uh, for all of you who want to attend our marriage and singles retreat, which will be in June, it's going to be June the 25th uh, in Atlanta. We're going to be at Mary Max, a uh, very awesome um, uh, soul food restaurant. We're also going to have speakers. So it's going to be a time of fun and fellowship, encouraging words. Uh, but listen, uh, it's $40 per person. And then um, the deadline to pay is June the 5th. It is June the 5th, um, and make sure when you do pay via Cash App or Givelify, uh, what you're going to do is make sure that you put in the memo for uh, marriage and singles retreat, marriage and singles retreat. So have so have uh, great announcements for the month of June. Y'all going to see Dr. Larissa again, because we're having our latest pajama party uh, virtual, and so this was great, too. We're having it June the 3rd, so on a Friday, 7 o'clock p.m., uh, going to talk about our mental health. Our mental health is very important, and so we're going to talk about foods to improve our mental health, um, how we can improve our mental health, how to fix our hair. Uh, Shannon was on before. She's a hairstylist in Atlanta. Valerie is going to talk about just why it is important for us to take care of our mental health. And so these are all great. This is going to be June. Um, so listen, stay tuned. Of course, we have a lot of things that are going on at Birmingham Bible Church. Our website is bhambc.org. So of course, we look forward to seeing y'all, um, if not this Saturday for our small group, but this Sunday uh, for uh, the message, the sermon series that we have going forth, what you should know about the end times, what you should know about the end times. So that is, uh, we've been walking through, it, uh, we are, folks, we're living in the last days, and so a pastor is getting us prepared uh, for that. So uh, that's all we have. And so, Miss Larissa, if you could share with us, you know, how we can get this journey started into um, eating healthy so that mm -hmm. we can be healthy. All right. So it's um, like exactly what we were just saying is, you know, pick one thing. You don't have to do all of the things at once because that can seem very, very overwhelming. So if you think that you could pick up a bag of apples um, at the grocery store the next time you're there and maybe start trying to eat one as a snack every single day, starting with that. Then once you've got that down, then say, okay, I'm doing this. Now I can start, you know, working on my fish intake. I can do one, one fish a week. I can do one plant-based meal a week. Um, and just doing things one at a time. They say it takes about three weeks to make or break a habit. Um, so if you, you know, you fall off the wheel in the first week, it's okay. You're like everybody else. You're totally normal. Um, but it takes about three weeks. So, you know, maybe just one month dedicate that to, okay, we're going to include fish in our, in our dinner menu this month. And we're going to once a week. And then the next month, maybe bump it up to twice a week. And then the next week, you, you know, keep going more. So I would say just keep it simple. Food doesn't have to be overcomplicated. Um, mm -hmm. And make sure that if you like it, keep eating it. If you don't like it, you know, find something else that you do like <laughs> um, from that list. Um, because there's all kinds of things. That's the best part about um, 
using diet um, as a tool for health is because it's so modifiable to your taste. Um, but yeah, and I guess Greta is also saying goodbye. I too, was so. looking at Greta. <laughs> She was like, I'm here too, guys. <laughs> I have some fish and salmon too. <laughs> a human. I mean, just a human. I love Greta. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, so thank you so much, Larissa, for all this great information. Uh, we will see you next time. Listen, folks, make sure you share this broadcast uh, with someone you know uh, who may have cancer or just, just someone in general. Uh, we need to get the word out how we need to, um, you know, make sure that we are eating foods that are that's fighting off uh, the cancerous cells. And so um, thank you for this information, Larissa. Until next time. June 3rd. We'll see everybody June 3rd. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.